Welcome back to History Science Fiber. This week we are dying with Okutiu with our special guest, Alana Putman. Hello and welcome to another edition of History Science Fiber. Now today I have teamed up once again with natural dyer from Arizona named Alana Putman, who will once again take us into the desert, this time to dye with the Okutiu blossoms. Let's join her you was the ocotillo and I'm trying not to back up into a cactus here um, but this is one of the ocotillos in my yard it is done but this did give up a couple of um, blossoms for Zoe's dye but just to show you so these are very very spiny um, during the springtime when they've gotten enough green or excuse me enough water the the bark whatever you call this skin of it um, will turn green as well and it'll put out leaves but then the rest of the time it honestly just drops the leaves so these blossoms here are what I snapped off and dried out and sent to Zoe um, and you have to be careful with how much you take so there's one I oops, sorry there's one I took there's one I left and uh, that is actually this year's growth so once those blossoms are done and they fall off that little kind of reddish stick that's left that's the new growth so when i'm harvesting these i want to be really really careful that i'm not taking very much from each ocotillo and then i'm going to several of them but very really a very unique um really neat plant you could actually snap these off and replant them and they will sprout a new ocotillo in fact, um, in some places in the southwest, especially Tucson, you don't see it very much up here, people will make fences of this. So they'll take apart an ocotillo, they'll wire it all together, and then they'll plant that in the ground and they have a living fence to, you know, keep predators out of their chickens or whatever. So, really neat plant. So, Alan have very kindly sent me 110 grams of the blossoms, and I noticed there were still the twigs inside, so I wanted to remove the twigs. So when I did a weight, I wanted to get two parts blossoms to one part fiber, which is what she had used in some of her experiments. So in order to ensure that we have enough blossoms for our two to one ratio, we need to know how much fiber we're dying. Um, and I'll talk about the mordants in a second, but there was 33 grams of wool. So then I go over to my um, octillo and I know that I need 66 grams to get that two to one ratio. So I'm just gonna measure it out, make sure I have 66 grams of the blossoms and then I should be ready for the rest of the dyeing. But again, whenever I'm dyeing with blossoms or even leaves, I do find I wanna stop and chop them up and I just find that that slicing into them um, interrupts just that waxy coating and is gonna allow more dye to, to interact with our fiber. So I do find it makes a big difference to stop and give it a quick chop um, and try to get those pieces kind of as small as possible. You will get more surface area, more internal structure and more dye coming out. I really think that it's worth doing that for sure. So now we're looking ahead, we're gonna need to heat up the blossoms in water and so one of the things I do is these paint mesh bags you don't need to use them you can also use cheesecloth um, I get these bags at the paint store they're really inexpensive and then I just reuse them and what that does is it allows me to heat up the blossoms um, and then add my fiber down the line and it keeps them separated so those are the six there's the 66 grams I've got it in the filter bag and I'm gonna put it in the jar then I'm gonna add water and heat it for an hour and then what I can just do is pull that bag out and then we're ready for the fiber all right let's dive into what the fiber is going to be this is all wool these are 20 meter long skeins these two have been pre-mordanted with 16 percent weight of fiber uh, for alum or aluminum potassium sulfate and then introducing them to metal in this way allows for the fiber to take up usually the color of the dye vat itself um, it's an important step um, to really, really getting the color. And if you're not getting good color out of your natural dyes, mordanting is a step to definitely look at. Um, I'll make a video specifically on mordanting pretty soon. Um, this one was pre-mordanted with 6% iron by weight of fiber. And you can see that it's a slightly darker color, more of a tan. But once we get into the dyeing, you'll really see that introducing it to iron is gonna really darken and push that color 
much, much darker. So those are the three. And the reason that we're dyeing with two skeins of alum is we're gonna use iron as what's called a modifier, or it goes in after the, the vat. So basically we're gonna dye these. These two are gonna come out the same color. And then this one is gonna get a post dye dip or a modifier into that iron. And it should go kind of a, a color somewhere in between. So we should end up with three distinct colors all from the same source. So now the time has come to put our dye vat together. Um, I've added the Ocotillo into the mesh bag, into the jar, and now I'm adding water. And what I'll be doing is a double boiler method. So when it comes to dyeing with Ocotillo, you want to decrease the pH. Um, at least this is what I've heard from people that have experimented more than I have with Ocotillo. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check the pH without any kind of modification and see where we're sitting. And we're looking eventually to end up, we want about, about a five, four or five. So at the moment, we're sitting at about sort of a six, five or six. So I've got some vinegar here and I've got my little half teaspoon. Why don't we see? I don't know, a little less than half, let's say. So we'll put that in. And give that a stir and then we'll see you can stir it in here um, what that gives us if I check again yeah so now it's sitting at about four so it's good I will keep checking sort of at every step to make sure that we maintain that lower um, acidic content because that should give us the colors that we're looking for. So here's our dye pot. We've got some liquid in there, some water, and then we're going to use a double boiler method with this. There we go. And then we're going to heat it in a double boiler method um, for one hour. And this is a good time to mention um, that you want your liquid in your dye vat only to simmer, never to boil. So uh, we'll do that. We'll simmer for an hour. So whenever you're adding fiber to a dye bath, you always want to give it a good soak ahead of time. So normally when my stuff is starting to heat up on the stove is when I want to add my fiber. And I tend to soak my alum mortented wool separately from my iron. And the reason is, is that iron can darken the yarn so much that if you all have it soaking in the same spot, you can actually contaminate some of this wool and it'll go darker as well. So generally what I'll do is just soak them separately at sort of a minimum of 20 minutes. What you're trying to do is get all of that trapped air out so that when it's added to the dye vat, all of that fiber can access the dye pigment and it should give you a better, more even color. So I'm just gonna add these in and then we're gonna pour the water in. We should be ready to go. So there goes our iron. And now that we've got them in the glass vessels, we're just gonna add our water. in theory our fiber should start bubbles should start coming out and it should start sinking
we've allowed the oquitillo to simmer for the hour and we've allowed it to cool. At this stage, we can remove the bag and the blossoms. As you can see, this is the big advantage of using these kinds of bags. And then now the dye bot, the dye vat is absolutely ready to go and we can put our fiber in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our fiber back in and then we're gonna slowly heat it back up to an hour. I find with these small amounts of wool, I don't track temperature as closely as I do with larger amounts. If I'm doing a big project, I absolutely wanna make sure I heat very, very slowly and cool very, very slowly at every step. Um, and that helps maintain the luster of the wool and it helps ensure that it's not going to felt, which can be a big problem, especially with alpaca, you've gotta watch that. But in this case, with these small amounts, it's not as big a deal, I find. Um, and so now that it's in there, I can heat it for the hour um, and see what kind of colors we're gonna get. Um, as you can see, the dye pot's gone kind of um, murky pink. So I'm curious what we're gonna get out of it. Um, but first, obviously, we've gotta let it do its thing and heat up to a simmer for that hour. So the big question is, how much do you stir the fiber? And I usually give it a gentle stir every 10 minutes or so. Um, and if it's a big thing of fiber, um, let's say over a pound, I will actually flip it at the 30 minute mark to really ensure that it's doing okay. So at this stage, we have let it cool. We've heated it for the hour, we've let it cool down. And now we're ready to pull the fiber out and see what has happened. And I'm super excited. So as you may recall, we had two skeins that were mordanted with alum. And now we're ready to introduce one of them to iron. Here's what the ferrous sulfate looks like. And I'm creating a really concentrated um, solution of the ferrous sulfate. You can see it's that color. It actually really smells quite irony. And we're going to add one of those alum skeins. They haven't been rinsed yet um, right into there. And we're going to leave it for about three minutes. And that's enough time to get a color shift. Um, if it's if you leave it in too long, you can find that the iron will actually chew up your yarn. So you've got to be a little bit careful. But here I let it sit for three minutes, gave it a stir, and now I'm ready. You can see just how receptive Okotio is to iron. And I'm excited to rinse everything.